So can I give you something to celebrate today? So uh, last Sunday was our Operation Christmas Child Dedication Sunday. And to date, I know we still have boxes that are coming in, but to date, you have given more than 1,800 Operation Christmas Child boxes. So, so that blows away. Last year, I think we did 1,000. And so we've done 1,800, and they're still coming in. And so we did it early in October. And so even though we're still done, if you still have one that you haven't brought in, you can still bring it in. And we would encourage you to bring it in as we impact the lives of boys and girls all around the world. And I want to thank our ladies' ministry. Um, I'm not sure whether Don is here, but Kathy and all of our ladies who have been so involved in that ministry, let's let them know how, how very much we appreciate them. And our goal is to make an impact, not only here globally, but our goal is to make an impact locally as well. So let me ask you an interesting question. How many of you are originally from South Florida? And so you were born and raised here. Raise your hands, all right? So, so South Floridians. Notice, that's not even half of us here today, right? All right, so how many of you were born somewhere else and you transplanted to South Florida, all right? That is, the, that is the vast majority of us here today. So in 2005, Vicki and I moved from Northeast Ohio to South Florida. We moved down here, and I'll be honest, instantly I thought, this is hands down the most beautiful place I have ever lived. I mean, I love, so, 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 I mean, I love the big royal palm trees. Don't you love the royal palm trees? And I loved everywhere we went, there was water. There was like water everywhere, glimmering, glistening water. And then there's the immaculate gardens that are all over the place. And, uh, and then I just like all the little animals, you know, whether they're the, the little lizards or something. I'm fascinated by that. I, I drive home away every day. And you might not like them, all right? I wouldn't like them if they were in my backyard. But, but, but I drive home every single day. I, I, I drove home this way where I saw all these lizards along this canal. And I remember thinking... I'm never going to get used to living in this place. Why, this is the most gorgeous place I've ever lived. So that was 13 years ago. And guess what happened? I got used to it. I got used to it. And so when I drive from home to here, I don't see the palm trees anymore. I don't see the beautiful water I don't see the immaculate gardens. I rarely even am fascinated by all the little lizards that are around. What do I see? I see the traffic, all right? I see crazy drivers. I see places that could be cleaner than it is, areas that I sit back and think, why doesn't the city do something about that? And then I drive through other areas and I see the, some unseemly parts of our city. And if I'm not careful, like many of us at times, it's easy for me to sit back and think, man, I wonder what it would be like to live somewhere else, to not live in South Florida. So let me ask you, what changed? Had the, had the palm trees changed? No, they were still here. Had the, had the water in the lakes drained away? No, it's still here. Are the gardens still meticulously kept? Many of them are. Are there still those little cute lizards that are all over the place? Yeah, the ones that get in your house and drive you crazy. I know that. All right. They don't bother me, but I'm telling you right now, if one gets in our house, Vicky moves everything. So it's like, it doesn't matter if it's 2 o'clock in the morning. We are finding that lizard before we go to bed at night. And uh, I'm like, go for it. I'm going to bed. God bless you. No, no, I generally move the furniture so she can do the catching. Here's what I'm saying today. South Florida didn't change. What I looked at changed. What I was seeing changed. My vision changed. I started looking at the wrong things. And I missed the beauty. South Florida. 
Today we begin a series, and I'm going to share my heart with you today, church. What might be, I, I don't want to use hyperbole today or over-exaggeration, but this might be one of the most important sermon series we've ever preached. We want to talk the next few, four weeks about what it means to be a city changer. What it means to be the presence of Jesus Christ in our community. Here are the questions we want to ask. What is it going to take for us to change our city? What, what is it going to take for us to make an impact on our community? What is it going to take for us to see city, community, and regional transformation? Those are answers, or those are questions that I want us to answer, Lord willing, in the next four weeks. As we look at God's word, we see the example more than anything else of Jesus Christ, and we try to emulate him. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 9. I want to read just four verses today, four verses that always grab a hold of my heart, and four verses that I trust, I pray, will grab a hold of your heart, not just your mind, but your heart today as well. Matthew chapter 9, I'll put it up on the screen, beginning in verse 35. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he complained because they frustrated him. Is that what the text says? When he saw the crowds, he got mad at the way they drove their cars. Is that what the text says? When he saw the crowds, he got discouraged at the drugs and the prostitution and the broken lives. Is that what it says? No, you know better. When he saw the crowds, he what? He had compassion on them because they were harassed and they were helpless, just like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, you maybe know this verse, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Would you pray with me today? And as you bow your head and you close your eyes for just a second, would you, would you do me a favor? Would you ask the Holy Spirit of God to speak to you today? Not just to teach you something. I hope I'll give you something that'll stick in your mind. But ask the Holy Spirit of God to speak to your heart today. Father, give us, give us eyes like Jesus. Help us to see our community as you see our community. Help us to feel what you feel. Give us a burden. Give us a broken heart. Give us compassion. Give us a desire to make a difference for your honor and for your glory. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Today we join with hundreds of churches across Broward County that are celebrating what we're calling Love South Florida. You're going to hear a little bit more about it at the conclusion of the service. Our prayer is that during the month of November, our community, our cities would see, they would feel, and they would experience the love of Jesus through his church. I would say, and I meet with all kinds of pastors on a regular basis, we do a great job of talking about the love of Jesus. I'm not sure how good a job we do at demonstrating the love of Jesus. We've also realized, and you're going to hear us talk more and more about it, that we can't reach our community on our own. Our church has been here for more than 65 years. We haven't reached our community in 65 years. What if, just what if, 
we would lock arms with other churches of like faith. And we would realize that it's not about building our kingdom, but it's about building the kingdom of God. You see, our goal at HCC is not just to be a church that holds services. When people drive by 441 or they drive by Taft, I don't want them to look and say, oh, there's the church that has services at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. Or, or there's the church that has that really handsome pastor. I'm sure that people say that as they drive by. I want our community to sit back and maybe they don't know anything else about our church. But I want our community to say, there's a church that loves people. There's a, there's a church that cares for people. There's a church that makes sacrifices for people. There's a church that demonstrates the love of Jesus. You see, we want to make a difference in our community. And we're locking arms with churches all around us. I'm meeting pastors that I didn't even know were close to us. And we're locking arms for the sake of the kingdom. And we're sitting back saying our number one goal is not to fill this auditorium as much as I would love to see this auditorium filled. As churches, we've filled auditoriums. We play music. We do all of that. And the needle is not moving in Broward County. We're sheep swapping, but we're not reaching people for Jesus. And we're sitting back saying, what is it going to take to begin to move the needle so that people in my neighborhood and people in your neighborhood and the people who live right next door to us and the people who live over here would be impacted not by the wonderful preaching of Brad or Brian or anybody else, they would be impacted by the simple fact that the people who attend this church from Monday to Saturday are loving them, are caring for them, and are being Jesus Christ to them. You see, our prayer is that Christ's kingdom would come in Hollywood just as it is in heaven. How can that come to fruition? How can we be that type of of church? How can God use us in that way? Well, this passage gives us insight into the life and the ministry of Jesus. And there's three things that we see about Jesus that I desire to have in my life, and three things that we see in Jesus that I desire for us to demonstrate and emulate as a church. The ver first, very simply, is this we have to see like Jesus saw. We have to see the people around us as Jesus sees them. When Jesus looks down on the city of Hollywood, when Jesus looks down on our city, when he looks down on our congregation today, he doesn't see skin color. He, he doesn't see the educational level of people in our auditorium. He doesn't see how much is in your bank account and how much is mine. He doesn't sit back and say, Boy, those people drive a lot of nice cars there at HCC. He doesn't see that. He doesn't see the way that you and I are dressed. Jesus looks at people differently. And, and, and the text says that when he saw the multitudes, he wasn't frustrated. He, he wasn't scared of them. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion by them. You see, what he saw affected his heart. How did he see the people to whom he ministered? The text uses two words. It says that he looked and saw the people. He saw that they were harassed, the text says. The word harassed is an interesting word. It, it, it literally means, the original word means to flay or to skin. The word is translated throughout the New Testament. It can mean battered, bruised, mangled, ripped apart, worn out, exhausted. And so as Jesus came in to, as he traveled around Galilee, by the way, there were some 200 villages around Galilee, and it says that Jesus literally was traveling from village to village, and as he traveled from village to village, he was surrounded by whom? He was surrounded by battered, bruised, mangled, ripped apart, worn out, exhausted people. Sounds a little bit like our community, does it not? When he saw them, he was moved with compassion. They were harassed. There's a second word that was used. He said he saw them as being helpless. 
The word helpless means to be thrown down. It means to be utterly helpless, to be defenseless. So here's the way Jesus summarized their condition. As he saw the people, he said, you know, they're, they're just like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep don't have their own sense of direction. They easily get lost. That was illustrated in the song, The Reckless Love of God, where God defines us as sheep and goes out into the crevices and the mountains and wherever to search for us. So, so as Jesus, as he saw these people, he saw the needs that they had rather than the nuisance that they were to him. I would say this church that when Jesus looks at Hollywood, he sees Hollywood the exact same way. As I mentioned, he doesn't see skin color. He doesn't see the diplomas on our wall. He doesn't see the car we drive. He's not frustrated by the traffic. He's not turned off by our diversity. Jesus sees us differently. He views differently. We look on the outside. He looks on the inside. We see the body. He sees the heart. Vicki sings the song, Let me see this world, dear Lord, as though I were looking through your eyes. Great, beautiful song, but here's what it means. God, help me to see the neighbor who plays his music so loud late at night that it makes me mad. Help me to see them like you see them. Look, Lord, that person that lives on our street that doesn't take care of their house and all of us neighbors complain about it and we talk to the association about it and we can't get them to do anything, help me to see them through your eyes. That person who cuts me off in traffic and gives me, you know, the sign of love, the universal sign of love. (laughs) Help me to love them and see them as you love them. How should we see people? Let me give you three ways, and then you're in your outline today. This is extremely practical. But as we look at our community, here's what we must see, because this is what Jesus sees. We must see, first of all, the lostness of our community. The lostness. In other words, we must see the spiritual condition of our neighbors. We must see the spiritual condition of our coworkers, of our community, yeah, of our family members as well. George Barner, who's probably the leading Christian researcher in our country. Maybe you've read some of his books. He's written books like The Frog in the Kettle, and he probably understands American Christianity more than anyone else. George has spent a lot of time in South Florida. And, and George Barna has created this criteria of what would be a, a follower of Jesus Christ, the, the minimum criteria of what would be a follower of Jesus Christ. And George Barna, who spends a lot of time in South Florida, says this about our community, not somewhere else. Here's what he says about South Florida. 4% of the population of South Florida are followers of Jesus Christ. That's four out of every 100 people. Church, Church, let me say this. We live on a mission field. We live in an area that is lost. We are surrounded by people who are lost. I remind our team on a regular basis, let's not be surprised when unbelievers act like unbelievers. Let's not be surprised when people who don't know Jesus act like they don't know Jesus. Why is that? Because that is their real condition. And we must see them that way. We must see the lostness of our region. We got to see the pain of our region. I wish, I know you come here on Sunday and we all look beautiful, do we not? What a handsome group of people. I wish you could sit in that lobby from Monday to Friday. And I wish you could see the people that walk through our doors that need help. People whose lives are a mess, 
They're looking for help, and someone tells them, if you'll go to Hollywood Community Church, they'll help you. You say, Brian, who, who, who walks through our doors during the week? Can I give you just a brief snapshot? And our staff knows this is true. We have, we have people who struggle with addictions who walk in our door, whether it's drug addiction, opiate addiction, whatever it is, they walk through our door. Now, they don't walk through the door and say, and we have great ladies who uh, voluntarily man that desk from Monday to Friday, but they don't walk through and say, hey, Bonnie, or hey, Mary, or hey, Marcia, I'm a drug addict, help me. Here's what they do. They walk through the door and they say, man, I lost my job. And as a result of losing my job, we lost our house. And as a result of losing the job in the house, I've lost my family. I don't have anything to eat. I don't have anywhere to sleep. Would you help me? Our ladies know that happens on a regular basis here. They come in seeking food. They come in seeking housing. They come in seeking gas for their cars. They came in seeking something else, something superficial, not knowing that what they need more than food or housing or gas is Jesus Christ. And we, and we sit with them, and we see the pain in their eyes. We feel the pain in their hearts, and we try to help them as best as we can. We have broken families from our community that walk into our doors Men, quite frankly, who struggle at being good husbands. Women who struggle at being good wives. Moms and dads who struggle with being good parents. Sadly, by the time that they walk in our doors, their family is already destroyed to such a degree that only a miracle will bring it back together. And they walk through our doors, and they're hurting. We have people that walk through our doors with mental illnesses. They don't know they're sick. Do they act crazy? Sometimes they do. Sometimes they act so crazy we don't know what we're going to do. Individuals who battle to cope with the everyday pressures of life, they need counseling. They need medication. They need help. But they come here and they're hurting. They come and we see and we feel the pain that they have. We see latchkey kids, parents who's, who are so busy with their jobs or so busy with their activities or so busy with their addictions that their kids lack attention. We can talk about joblessness. We can talk about alcoholism. We can talk about sexual addictions. We can talk about so much more. I'm not exaggerating. They walk through our doors week after week. Here's what I want you to see, church. We live in a community that is in pain. We live in a community that is struggling. Yesterday, I, I met with Eddie Copeland, who's the director of Church United. Eddie was here, and Eddie looks at me and says, Brian, I want you to know, he said, we consider Hollywood as one of, if not the most difficult place to minister in South Florida. Why is that? Because the people all around us are in pain. They're hurting. They don't know what to do. They don't know what the answer is. See the lostness, see the pain, see the brokenness. You see, as a result of the lostness and the pain, our community is broken. We can look at every area of our community and we can see its brokenness. The educational system is broken. And, and I'm not saying that as a criticism to our educators here. We have phenomenal educators that are doing a great job, but within a stone's throw of our church are several schools that are Title I schools that are struggling, and the kids are struggling to get an education, to get what they need. Business is broken. The arts are broken. Government is broken. The media is broken. Social services are broken. Even sports are broken. That's not a criticism of the Miami Dolphins. It's not. Nobody, nobody accused me of that afterward, all right? All of these components are broken. And you and I know in our head, we know that the only answer is whom? 
It's Jesus. But we see their lostness, we see their pain, and we see their brokenness, and it frustrates us. It angers us. Oh, if I could only live somewhere else. Somebody would make a difference here. Church, we've got to see like Jesus sees. Can I ask you today, how do you see your community? Maybe you're like Brian. Used to grab your heart, but you become accustomed to it. Palm trees don't affect you anymore. Beautiful water doesn't affect you anymore. All of that, you see the pain and the brokenness, and it aggravates we got to see like Jesus sees. If we're ever going to make a difference, we got to see the people around us like Jesus sees them. And by the way, cities are filled with people. Our city is filled with people who bear the image of Jesus Christ, bear the image of God, and God loves them. There is no one in this city, there is no one in your community, there is no one on your street whom God does not love and whom Jesus did not die for. We have to see them that way. Let me share a second thing with you. We have to love them like Jesus. We not only have to see them like Jesus, we have to love them like Jesus. It says that when Jesus saw the multitudes, he what? We've already joked about it, but he what? He was moved with what? He was moved with compassion. The word compassion here is an interesting word. It's the word from which we get our word gut. All right, that's the word. That's the Greek word. It's the word from which we get our word gut. We express our emotions in this day and age by our heart, do we not? We look at our spouse, we look at our kids, and we say, I love you with all of my, what do we say, heart. During New Testament times, they didn't express their emotions through their heart. They expressed their emotions through their gut. And so it would have been completely legitimate to look at your spouse and say, I love you with all of my guts. As a matter of fact, why don't you just take a second and do that. Look at your spouse and tell him or her that you love him or her with all of your gut. Listen, you get it. Stress, tension, anxiety, all of them affect our digestive system. Is that not right? Stress affects your digestive system. Anxiety affects your digestive system. Here's what this verse is literally saying, literally. It says that Jesus saw the multitudes and Jesus' belly and his bowels were moved because of them. Jesus saw the multitudes and he had what? He had an upset stomach. He had a knot in the pit of his stomach. He had a stomach ache. He had a belly ache. He was moved with compassion. We see our community and we're concerned. We see everything that's happening in our community and we're concerned. I don't think there's a person here today that wouldn't sit back and say that they're not concerned about what is taking place in our community. But church, here's what I want you to catch, and this is what I want to resonate and rattle around in your head and let it make its way like a pinball machine down to your heart, okay? There is a difference between concern and compassion. There is a difference between concern and compassion. Concern makes us worry. Concern makes us fearful. Concern makes us avoid certain parts of town because we don't want to come across what we're seeing. Concern makes us bypass certain people that make us feel uncomfortable. Concern makes us not speak to neighbors that we might disagree with or who anger us or who don't live their lives like we do. Yes, we are concerned about them. Concern makes us move somewhere else. Concern causes us to disengage from our community. Concern causes us to cross our arms. 
and exclaim, man, something needs to be done there. Somebody needs to do something. Our city, our community is a mess. Someone needs to do something. Concern causes us, though, to not be the ones to do it. Concern causes us to disengage. Concern causes us to distance ourselves. Concern causes us to drive home and pull the car in the garage and shut the garage door and not speak to the broken neighbors around us. We're concerned about our community, but we're not compassionate about it. Here's what I wrote in your notes. Concern leads to passivity. It leads to passivity. As I mentioned, it causes us to throw up our arms and explain, yeah, we live in a broken community, but what can I do? What can we do? The problem is too big. Nobody can resolve it. And so we try to elect new officials, and when those officials can't solve the problem, we try to elect other new officials, and when they can't solve the problem, we try to elect other new officials, and we sit back and say, that's broken. Nothing can be done. Even though, church, you and I serve a sovereign God who has the power, who has the authority to transform communities, we do nothing because we're disengaged. We come to church, we sing a few songs, we listen to the message, but we really don't think that anything can be done to transform our communities. Concern doesn't compel us to do anything. We're concerned, but we're not compassionate. If I can say this in a loving, pastoral way, too many Christians, too many of us are concerned about our city, but we're not compassionate. You see, concern causes us to get disengaged. Compassion, on the other hand, what? It moves us. Compassion leads to activity. Concern leads to passivity. But compassion leads to activity. Now, let me say this. Compassion is not something that you muster up. It's not something you say, okay, starting today, Brian, I promise you, I'm going to be compassionate. No, you're not. (laughs) Traffic's going to frustrate you as much tomorrow morning as it does today. All the ills of our society are going to frustrate you as much tomorrow as it does today. Compassion is not something that you produce. You say, Brian, where do we get it from then? Compassion is God-ordained. Compassion is Holy Spirit-empowered. Compassion is Jesus-like. It's an inner desire. It's an inner desire that compels us to make a difference in our community. It compels us to get off of the sideline and to get into the game. It compels us to make a difference. You say, Brian, where do you get that from? I get it from Jesus. Jesus saw the multitudes and he what? He, he had compassion on them. I find it interesting. So it says that Jesus went from village to village. Can you imagine? Think with me for just a second. Can you imagine how much of a rock star Jesus was? All right, to use our terminology, all right? He was a rock star. So uh, I'm a private person, all right? I, I love, you're going to think bad led me. I love walking in the grocery store and nobody recognizing me. Is that true, Vicki? I mean, because of my, 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 my position, I'm, I'm recognized. And so there's a lot of times I'll go home and Vicki say, okay, everything good? Yeah, I got everything. And nobody saw me, all right? <laughs> nobody recognized me. So I got these battered shorts on and my hair's all over the place. And thankfully, nobody saw me. Can you imagine everywhere Jesus went, there were crowds with him. Everywhere he went, children and adults, the lame, the blind, the deaf, the mute, everybody followed him. And Jesus didn't make an itinerary with the disciples saying, okay, now today we're here, tomorrow we're here. Okay, what's the best way we can get from here to here so I don't have to have contact with anybody? 
I don't want to be bothered by those blind people. I don't want to be bothered by those lame people. No, it says he went from village to village doing what? Healing all the people. I mean, he, he didn't run away from needy people. He ran to needy people. He, he looked for opportunities to minister to them. Why is that? You can say, ah, he's God. Yeah, he is. But he had compassion on them. He felt something in the pit of his stomach that motivated him to do something. Church, here's what I want you to see today. When we see like Jesus, we will love like Jesus. And when we love like Jesus, we will act like Jesus. So so to make a difference in our community, we got to see like Jesus. I know I'm repeating myself. We have to love like Jesus. The third one is this. We have to act like Jesus. So what did Jesus' compassion motivate him to do? I I have to admit, I I struggled with this in the the text just a little bit. So his compassion motivated him to do what first? To pray. (laughs) I said I struggle with that because I'm a type A person. I'm a, I'm a get it done type of guy. Ashamedly, I work first and pray last. At times my MO, and uh, you, you know, if you think badly of me, I, I apologize, you can elect a different pastor, but I have a tendency to work first and if I can't handle the situation, then I pray. Anybody like me here today? Prayer, prayer isn't a first recourse for us, it's a second recourse. Or it's a third recourse. Why is that? Because we think, we would never admit it, but we think we have the wherewithal to do it. We think we have the wherewithal to make a difference. We think we have the wherewithal to change our kids. We think we have the wherewithal to fix our marriages. We think we have the wherewithal to make a difference in our community. And so we come up with great plans. We come up with great initiatives. We work and we work and we work as if everything depended on us. But I sit back and read this and see that the all-powerful God incarnate Jesus, when he saw a need, what did he do? He prayed. It's interesting because if I would have saw the harassed, I would have said, okay, Peter, James, John, come here. we got to form a committee to minister to the harassed. All right, you guys are starting a harassment ministry, all right? And then, Bartholomew, you got to come over. We're starting a helpless ministry. All right, so this is a ministry for the harassed. Who's in? This is a ministry for the helpless. Who's in? And then we got those smelly sheep that are in need of a pastor. Who's willing? So let's organize something. Jesus didn't do that. He, he saw the multitudes. He was broken for them. And he called the disciples together. And he said, man, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray. Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers. You see, church, compassion compels us to pray. Compassion compels us to pray. We don't pray because we're not compassionate. So one of the things that we want to do in our community is we want to walk the streets of our community and beg the Holy Spirit of God to make a difference to transform lives, to transform families, to see people come to Christ, to see community transformed. So yesterday we set aside a prayer walk, community prayer walk. Our church is some 500 strong. You know how many people came to our prayer walk? 13. We had 13 people come walk the streets and pray. 
Listen, my goal is not to beat you up this morning. Please don't feel like, man, Brian's stepping all over my toes. Here's what I want you to see. Compassion drives us to our knees. And you can sit back and say, okay, Brian, I didn't come yesterday. That's fine. Walk your street. Beg for God to do something in your community. Walk your neighborhood. Pray for your family. Listen, let's realize that we have an all-powerful, authoritarian king who is our God, who has said, go out and represent me and your community. And by the way, all power is given to me, and I give you that power to transform a community for Jesus Christ. But it's only going to happen, church. If, pray, if compassion drives us to our knees, oh. what would happen if God's people took this seriously? We sat back, and as pastors, we dreamed, and I know it's going to take a few years to get the ball rolling, but we sat back and we're dreaming. What would it be like if we could take hundreds if not thousands of people to the streets of Hollywood and see God do a work of transformation in our community. It might not happen after a day. It might not happen after a week. It might not happen after a month. But what if we consistently prayed and begged God to do something in our community, something that we can't do, something bigger than us, something larger than us, something that can only be attributed as a work of God. What would happen if we took that seriously? Here's a video of a lady who did just that. I want you to catch this video. This is the North Highlands area, just outside Sacramento. This used to be a very thriving area, springing from, mostly from McClellan Air Force Base. The base closed, and since the closure, the whole of the community economically was impacted because all the jobs left. I have been living in the vicinity of this area for close to 20 years. I was part of a ministry, but felt that there was more we could do to invest ourselves in the community around us. We looked around and noticed that every direction we looked in, there was an apartment complex. I felt I heard the Lord say, this is the place and these are the people. When we came to Logan Park, we knocked on their door and said, if you would let us, we'd love to come in and do the women's Bible study. And they said to us, it'd be great to have you come if you would also staff and run the after-school program, skill development classes, those kinds of things out of our community center. We would love to have you come. So we came in and we did do the women's Bible study, but more than anything else, the traction that really took hold is the after-school program where we involve ourselves in the children, uh, helping them with their academics. Uh, we have boys' clubs, girls' clubs, those kinds of things. When we came here, Logan Park was riddled with crime, a lot of gang violence, child prostitution. There was a darkness, different than the nighttime. Prayer is the key, I believe, that has gotten us every place that we are. We pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, send your angels now, God, to surround, oh God, each household. We prayed for 52 weeks, and at the end, it was like a veil of darkness receded, as though that blanket had been lifted up off of this community. I guess my preference is to be quiet, sitting at home, reading a book, but the needs of others pulls me out of myself. Some of the needs of the community uh, here at Logan Park uh, include the basic needs of food and clothing. So once every week, we give out groceries, bags of groceries to everybody who comes, anyone who comes. These are people who 
perhaps thought they were the forgotten, the castaways. Can I just grab one of these? Yeah. Thank you. I come from this background. I am the eldest of 12 children. We lived in low-income housing, and there were people who came by, like maybe Christmas, everybody wants to come and be a blessing around holidays. But they were just here and gone. Never a face, never a hand, never a heart that stayed. For us, the success is in being here. Food giveaway, Miss Emma. It is very important for there to be consistent presence. God bless you, precious. You. This is a life investment because Christ invested his life for us. Not from afar, but up close and personal. He got into the mess with us. It is a formidable foe to replace hopelessness with hope. We have continued to blanket it with prayer and we have continued to see the Lord respond. In the name of Jesus, we pray for wisdom. Yes. We pray that we do not get ahead of you and we do not lag behind you, God. And so we lift up households now, households and families, oh God, who would normally go a different way in the name of Jesus. Put them in sync now, God, with your timing. Let them not worry about the things that have passed or worry about what is ahead. Let them rest now. Rest now. And that rest, oh God, will bring peace. Peace into every household. Peace into every household. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. So, so as you watch that video, somebody tell me, I know we're in a large auditorium. Somebody tell me what stuck out to you from that video. Something that you saw Joy do or that group do that stuck out to you. She was reaching out to the people just like Christ would. Absolutely. Absolutely. Who else? It wasn't manufactured. You said a few minutes ago. Yeah. Absolutely. Did, did Joy look sincere to you? She walked, walked that community for 52 weeks. Said it took 52 weeks before they begin to feel the darkness left. So what would happen after four weeks if she would have sat back and said, this is crazy, this isn't working? Or if after three months if she would have said, this is crazy, this isn't working? She would have never received the spiritual breakthrough and experienced the spiritual breakthrough. And by the way, her name's Joy. Did you see Joy on her face? It wasn't like she's like, somebody's making me do this. Unbelievable joy. And did you notice she also said presence, the ministry of presence. You got to be there. You got to consistently be there in people's lives. Listen, church, I'm looking at, I want you to know, I'm, I, I've been in ministry for 35 years. I don't think I've ever enjoyed anything anymore than I enjoy pastoring and being a part of the team at Hollywood Community Church. I'm looking at some of the greatest people I have ever ministered with and ministered alongside of. But I'm telling you, church, God can do so much more through us. If we will just believe him. If we will allow him to produce compassion in us that would drive us to the street. So, so you say, Brian, what are you asking? And I'm almost done. Here's what I'm asking. I'm asking for a couple of families to stand up and say, Brian, we're going to walk our street every week for the next 52 weeks asking and begging and trusting God to do something. 
We're going to begin to love on and care for the people in our neighbor, just to be there, just to be the presence of Jesus to them, to see what they need, to love on them and care for them. Nothing magnanimous, nothing huge, nothing outside the realm of possibility. We're going to sit back and say, let's make a difference in the lives of people. You see, let me finish your outline. So, so Jesus' compassion motivated him to pray, and Jesus' compassion motivated him to serve. So, so he went through the villages healing and, 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 and ministering to people. So, so, so as I mentioned, he, he wasn't bypassing them. He wasn't walking by them saying, listen, listen, I got other things more important to do than you. I'm sorry, I got a preaching engagement. I got to get to this preaching engagement. No, he... he he, he walked past needy people, he was moved by their needs, and he realized that he had the ability to meet their needs, and when his God-given power, he did what? He met their needs. I, I was reminded as I read that of 1 John chapter 3 and verse 17. I think I have the verse up there. Can we put it up there? But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, should be a question mark, how does the love of God abide in him. So here's what it's talking about. Church members who drive by needy people week after week and month after month and wish that somebody would do something but don't do anything. People who have time to dedicate to ministry and don't dedicate time. People who have resources to dedicate to ministry and don't dedicate resources. People who have abilities to dedicate to ministry and don't do it. We have God-given things that God has given to us and we walk by people that have needs and we're concerned we're concerned but we're not compassionate we're not we're not broken I remember I'm, I'm, I'm done I know I keep saying this Vicky and I were in Mexico City we'd been there for a few years all of a sudden, we began to notice street boys in Mexico City. Boys, I'm not talking about 17, 18-year-old boys. I'm talking about 8, 9, 10-year-old boys who were on the street. They had these little plastic containers filled with glue. They were high as a kite on glue. As a result of sniffing glue, their nose was just always running. They were broken. They were hungry. They would stand on the street, and they would beg, and our heart became broken for these kids. I actually had the opportunity to go down in what they call a cola de era, down into the sewer and see the place where these little boys were living, stench and filth. These are eight to 12 year old kids. Had no idea where mom and dad were. Had no idea what was going on in their life. And we just began to pray that God would use us as a church to minister to them. And God brought a couple named Chewy and Rosario who were working with that ministry. And for seven years in Mexico City, we were able to minister to street kids. We used to have street kids come to our church. Remember, Vic? We'd have a whole bunch of street kids in our church that come to church. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about allowing the Holy Spirit of God to place someone on your heart and begin to minister to them. You see, church, the only way we're going to see and experience citywide transformation is when we see like Jesus, we love like Jesus, and we act like Jesus. When we do that, we open ourselves up for God, for the power of the Holy Spirit of God to use us way beyond our talents and our abilities. Would you pray with me today? Lord, I pray that you'd help us to see our community. As we drive down 441 and we see places where Prostitutes walk the street at nights. And drug addicts sell their drugs on the street corner. Instead of giving us a heart of anger, I pray you'd give us a broken heart. Help us to realize that Jesus died for those people. 
And Jesus desires to reach them just as he reached us. Break our heart for our community. Pull us out of our disengagement. Pull us out of our doldrums. Pull us out of our normal life. Pull us out of our routine. Pull us out of our race to get ahead and to provide and all of that. And help us to realize that you've called us to be salt and light in the midst of a dark community. Move us from concern to compassion. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.